Hi, welcome to K-Pod, the podcast about Korean Americans and arts and culture from Korean American Story. I'm Catherine Hong, a writer and editor. And I'm Juliana Sohn, a photographer. Happy New Year, Juliana. Happy 2022. Yeah, Happy New Year, Catherine. Can you believe we're still recording on Zoom? Yeah, it's too bad. We were so lucky that we had that nice window when we could interview Jason Kim in your apartment. That was super fun. Yeah, it was really nice to be in the same room with our guests and, you know, have it be all nice and intimate. But um, we are getting ready to launch season four of K-Pod. Um, can you believe it? Uh, and uh, our first guest of season four is director, animator, Peter Sohn. Now, we heard about Peter through a an, an indirect way because he wasn't immediately on our radar. And the founder of Korean American Story, H.J. Lee, brought him to our, our attention because he had heard about Peter through his parents who owned and ran a framing and art store in White Plains, New York. Of course, Juliana and I immediately Googled him and realized that Peter Son has been involved in like every major Pixar movie of the past 20 years, um, including Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Ratatouille, all the movies our kids grew up watching. Peter has been involved in, deeply involved in, with the animation, with the storytelling, and he's even voiced some major characters, including um, the brother Emil in Ratatouille. So while we may not have known his name, we've been hearing his voice and also his likeness was used for the, um, you know, adorable character Russell in Up and, uh, you know, one of the first Asian characters in a big animation. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty funny to hear him explain how he came about to be the physical model for Russell who was, I think, definitely the first Asian protagonist in a Pixar movie. So Peter opens up and shares so many intimate stories about his family, especially, which was really fantastic. He was so inspired by his mom. And uh, um, we were so saddened to hear that uh, since our recording last fall that she had passed away. And uh, we wanted to send our deepest condolences to Peter and the Sohn family. Yes, thank you, um, Peter, for sharing all these great stories and wonderful pictures, which we're going to post on Instagram. If you and your family and the family's grocery store in the 70s. Hope everyone enjoys listening to this episode with Peter Song. Welcome to season four. So if you've seen a Pixar movie in the last 20 years, that means you've almost certainly enjoyed the work of director, animator, and voice actor Peter Song. His credits include Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Ratatouille, Wally, and 2015's The Good Dinosaur, which he directed and co-wrote. Peter grew up in the Bronx, where his parents owned a grocery store, and went on to attend Cal Arts. He got a start in animation during college when he had a summer job working on The Iron Giant and joined Pixar in 2000. Along with his talents in the studio's art and story departments, he's distinguished himself by his voice acting. In Ratatouille, he played the rat Emil. In Monsters University, he played Squishy. In The Good Dinosaur, he played Forrest Woodbush. And in Pixar's most recent release, Luca, he plays Ciccio. More fun facts. Peter served as the model for lead character Russell in Up, and Peter co-directed the English language version of Ponyo. It's a tremendous body of work, and Catherine and I are so delighted to meet you today, Peter. Thank you for having me. Uh, are you kidding? I'm very excited to talk to you both. And uh, I forgot about Chicho, and uh, they, they pulled a trick on me because they said, like, you're going to play this character Chicho, but then they told me later that in Italian that means chubby. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> how, what? how could you do that? Does it really? That's what they told me. But I, I laughed at it pretty good. So, Peter, we connected with you in a different way than most of our previous guests of K-Pod. As you know, we found you through your parents' art supply store. So I'll, I'll tell the story so people understand. So H.J. Lee, who's the founder of Korean American Story, was looking for a place to get some art frame that had been donated for the annual gala. And he asked a Korean friend of his if she knew a local place. This person directed them to your parents' shop. 
HJ thought your parents were lovely and your dad was had a great eye and gave him a good price. <laughs> he worked the Korean connection, got a great price. Um, and then as he got to know your family a little bit, they revealed they had a son who happened to be, you know, big shot at Pixar. So as soon as Juliana and I heard about you, we thought, oh, my God, we have we have to get in touch with Peter. He's worked on every movie that we love. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, um, I have to tell you, working in animation and my parents, show, my, my parents art supply shop, they were right next to another, um, at the time, rival animation studio called Blue Sky that was right there. And a lot of those folks that worked there come over to Pixar and I meet hundreds of people that are like, I went to your father's shop and I saw your brother and I saw your mom and, uh, you know, they did the frames for us. And uh, it, they have this legacy of, of where I'm meeting a lot of other people that went to the shop that, you know, warms warms me to my heart every, every time I hear it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's great that you guys got connected that way. Well, can you tell us a little bit about your family? Because we know that for most of your childhood, um, your parents owned were in the grocery business, right? And you almost kind of grew up in the store in the Bronx. Can you just tell us a little bit about that experience? And even if you want to tell us a little bit about your parents before they came from Korea. Yeah, my father came here in 1971. He started working at a like as a as a pretzel cart guy in Manhattan like he would sell pretzels in Midtown you know and uh, from there he's triggered this you know he created this life but uh, my mom came a couple years after that and uh, they were sort of match made is what I like to say but the truth of it is I think my dad just hounded her for like weeks and uh, uh, you know, he's this short, bald guy, and my mom is this, like, very tall, you know, um, beautiful woman, and uh, she didn't really want to have anything to do with him. And uh, um, But I think that a, a pastor that they knew uh, in, in the Bronx uh, kind of looked up my dad's family in Korea and uh, uh, found out that, you know, he came from a really respectable family and... Uh, you know, and said that he was a good man. And in five weeks after knowing each other, got married. My mom came through nursing. She went to uh, nursing school, and I think it was somehow connected to the American military, I think. And then uh, uh, came out to Chicago with uh, another friend who was also uh, uh, in the nursing school. Yeah, so they somehow got, to, she somehow got to New York um, with her friend from Chicago and uh, met my father. Like a lot of um, Koreans at that time when sort of the immigration quotas kind of opened up for Korea, started pouring in. But uh, I'm very proud of my father's kind of trajectory from there because, you know, yeah, he did, you know, he started with nothing. He, his story that he always tells us when we were kids was, I came here, you know, with $150. $75, I rent a pretzel cart. And then uh, the other 75, I rent apartment over Hooker House. He always say Hooker House, like, you know, like in, in, in Harlem somewhere. And, uh, and uh, you know, as kids were like, what is that? Oh my gosh. And, uh, and uh, he would tell us these in, insane stories of just like selling pretzels for like a quarter, but the, the Greeks who ran the, uh, the, the, the pretzel business would take 13 cents out of every pretzel and uh, that he would save these pennies uh, to, 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 to finally get, you know, a grocery store somewhere. And it took him a while. Gosh, the, there's my favorite story that he would tell is that like, you know, if you, if, if you've been in Midtown Manhattan, you and see, you see these, um, carts being, so, you know, like on these corners, my, my father said, you know where they go to the bathroom? And I go, oh my God, I never even thought about where do these, where do these folks go to the bathroom? And he goes, I had, you have to make deal with hotel. You have to make deal with hotel uh -huh. there. And then someone come out to watch your cart. And then, then you can go to the bathroom. And I'm like, oh, I, I look at all the whole world so differently with my father's stories. And then, you know, the permits that would be necessary, like the best money is when you sell in Central Park and that he would try to sneak his cart over there. But in the 70s, all these, you know, cops on horseback would run you out. And so there's just these like visuals of just like, you know, being chased and it's just so dramatic. Uh, but from there, you know, he, he just, you know, he, he, for a couple of years, that's what he was doing. Then he ran out of luck and he lost, I think, all his money. I, th I think he he was like homeless for a day or so. This is what he said. Like, I slept in the park. I had no money. And wow. uh, um, there was uh, a Korean guy, this uh, this 
guy that my brother and I were just talking about, like, who was this legendary Korean guy that helped my dad? And uh, but hearing that my dad was kind of down on his luck and needed some work, invited him to go to Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, to work at his, you know, factory, you know, doing um, what is it? Vacuum sealing coffee. The guy, this Korean guy, invented the process of vacuum sealing, and he had this patent for it, and he was very wealthy, and uh, helped my dad up. Once he had saved enough money, he bought the grocery store on 241st Street in the Bronx. And then, um, um, uh, so I don't know if he got married before the shop or during that shop, but um, I was born there. My brother was born two years later, but my dad had that grocery store and built, saved up enough money from that to another grocery store in New Rochelle. And then in New Rochelle, he saved up enough money to buy that block out. So he bought the block. And then from then, you know, like the hours were killing him. And uh, I think sometime in high school, he was just like, I need to find another job. That's not seven days a week from six in mm -hmm. the morning till like mm -hmm. 11 at night. And uh, he, he took my brother and I to the Javits Center. I don't know, in the 90s or whatever it was. And uh, he was literally walking around this, you know, convention, you know, looking for another other work. Wow, he was shopping for a career, his next move. Yeah, and then he found uh, this uh, guy who was making frames. And uh, my dad was very curious about- Thompson? Yeah, Thompson, yeah, exactly, this guy, <laughs> literally. And uh, he said, I'm selling the business if you're interested. And my father said, yes, and he took it. And then from th throughout high school, he was just nine to fiving it at this art supply shop. So only as a really young kid, do you remember your parents having that that grocery, but it, vivid memories of that shop? He had, he had that grocery till we, we were eight. And then he had another grocery that we grew up, our childhood was in, in the New Rochelle one. And then high school was the art supply shop. And so there were these two main grocery stores. The Bronx one, I remember, you know, a lot from. Uh, I remember, you know, my father building it. I remember my mom changing my brother's diaper on the meat cutting thing in the back of it. You know, it's this <laughs> tiny hole in the wall. You know, and uh, um, I remember my father, you know, racial profiling and always asking me to like follow these kids or whatever was around the sh around the store. Uh, there's just there's just you know, the the idea of the, the you know the, the English as a second language, just how my mother and father were able to kind of operate within that section of North Bronx where it was a lot of West Indians and Jamaicans and uh, you know, uh, West Africans and uh, in English was everyone's second language. And so there was a lot of times I remember my mm -hmm. father not being mm -hmm. able to communicate, but visually the empathy that he had for people that like, you know, didn't have enough that he would just offer free food. Then the other side of it, when he would be, you know, uh, my mom or dad would be very sensitive about like, oh, this person's going to steal. And that kind of other side of it, you know, where the, the some of the kind of the negative you know, xenophobia and racism that would have happened at that time. And so it was a, uh, you know, a lot of really strong memories, but also, you know, not all of them were great. You know, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, racist shit happening to them and us, all that sort of business. But, uh, you know, yeah, like you're saying, my dad just kept moving on up, you know, just kept saving and saving and uh, getting to that next level. Were there Koreans um, where you lived when you were young in the Bronx? Yeah, yeah. The, um, not in the Bronx there, but to the church that we were going to at that time. And uh, um, at, when my father first came, I think there were only six like other Korean grocers in Manhattan at that time. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, my father knew all of them. And uh, we would sometimes hang out with them or have like a yebe with like some other church Koreans. And uh, soon after my father had gotten that grocery store, he brought his older brother, his young, our Kunabaji, to um, New York. And uh, so when he saved money, he uh, started an SAT school in Queens called CCB. Uh, uh, because we were family, the, our uncle allowed my brother and I to go there for free. And so meaning th those, that was the Korean connection was like, you know, the church and CCB uh, mm -hmm. was uh, mm -hmm. uh, and was the Korean community uh, through most of childhood, you know. So you were prepping for the SAT since the fourth grade. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I could say I was prepping. I think that's where a lot of my drawing <laughs> abilities really kind of flourished because I would get these, you know, these practice tests and I would just be drawing the whole time and my you know, uncle would be... You had better have gotten a perfect score on the SATs after all that. <laughs> Again, I'm saying I drew a lot, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, what kind of kid were you? What, what, what kind of kid was I? I don't know. the. Well, like when you were at the Pixar age of kids, let's say like eight to 12. We were explorers, I guess. My brother and I would bike around New York all the time and uh, we'd get into scraps about, you know, there'd be the, you know, the Italian playground and they would say like, no, you know, derogatory terms around here, you know, and uh, they, and we'd, we'd stand up for ourselves, you know, we were pretty creative. We, you know, we played a lot with the, in the aisles with stuff, you know, with, we didn't have much. Wasn't this the 70s when the Bronx is burning? Yeah, the son of Sam was 77. I was born 77. I remember reading all about that. But at that time, I don't remember it being dangerous. I don't remember it being violent. Oh. I just remember there just being a lot of different types of families that were poor and down on their luck. I, I remember that. Um, um, there were a lot of aggressive kids, but it didn't feel like it was, you know, dangerous. It wasn't like, I don't remember people getting killed or anything like that. It was just... Mm -hmm. Were there other Korean families in the Bronx? Because typically we all think of Queens as the area where all the Koreans settled. No, there, there weren't a lot. Not that I remember. Um, uh, mm -hmm. every, yeah, we would only go to Flushing for food and, and mm -hmm. groceries. And uh, um, and the church was in New Rochelle, and so most of the the Koreans that were that kind of went to that church were all over, you know, from Co-op City to Westchester. They were just all over the place. But I, yeah, not a lot in the Bronx. And were your parents um, like pushing you academically all the time, the way that certain Korean, <laughs> most Korean parents seem to be, or what? What were their expectations as you understood them? Yeah, it was to get the best grades possible, to essentially do what they had been told from the church community mm -hmm. about how mm -hmm. to get into a good college. And obviously my uncle owned an SAT school, so there was a track, you know what I mean, that, mm -hmm. uh, that you were going to follow. I was clearly very quickly not going to be following that track at an early age, you know. the Well, what, what was that? Because you were just not interested or um, you're so busy drawing or messing around? Yeah, I got into a lot of arguments with my mother most of the time because she would look through my homework and there would be, you know, I, I, you know, my brother had found a couple recently about like, you know, these, you know, textbooks with just, you know, animation in the corner of the book. I would just be making flip books in there and she would be so mad about why are you drawing? I had a lot of like kind of headbutts with her about art and that world and her, her focus was that's not going to be your future. And uh, we fought a great deal about that. My father remained pretty silent about that for most of my life. Like he also agreed with my mother that art wasn't going to be future, but he was never adamant about that. My mother was, oh. and uh, it was, and I think high school when we discovered, my brother and I discovered why my mother was so against it. And uh, it's cause we had found out through, what was it? I think he had a trip to Korea that, my mother was an artist. She in she she's from a family of five, four daughters, and then the you know the classic last one was a son. And my mom was the closest to the son in age, you know, so she was the youngest daughter. And uh, um, at that time, everything was given to the son, and uh, she wanted to go to art school. She's an incredible artist, you know. We had found these drawings of hers of sketches she did of us as babies and there's beautiful like mm -hmm. renderings that were like oh my god look at mom she, you know she has this amazing talent but that got squashed through just time that that period of you know having right after the korean war they didn't have any money and so they were only going to send one kid to college and it wasn't going to be my mom and so we talked to our mom about it, and that that sort of got beat into her and so that the art wasn't ever going to be a future and so that's what she knew, and that's what she was trying to teach my right. brother and I. And when you were making these flip books and these drawings, what were you copying? Was it, were you watching a lot of TV or reading comic books or? Yeah, it was, I think in elementary school, like, I don't know, sixth grade, there was this book that had come out on animation and it was, I think like $75. And it was just like the most expensive book yeah. we'd ever seen and or I had ever seen. And it was at B. Dalton's. And uh, uh, I, I asked my mom or dad at that time, could we buy this book? And they said, we can't afford that. And uh, I was so obsessed over getting it. Like, you know, I was just working and whatever to get the money to buy this one book. And uh, I'm sure thinking back on it, that must have been something for my parents to that I had one focus. I didn't have any other focuses, you know, and that to get this book. But that book really um, opened my eyes. 
So you got it? You you, you got the book? I, I, I still have it. It's, it's this old book on and had flip books oh, in wow. it. And uh, um, I was drawing that. But yeah, it was a lot of TV. It was a lot of comic books and it was a lot of trying to understand what that was. Like what cartoons do you remember watching obsessively as a kid? Were there certain cartoons you loved? Yeah, Voltron was a huge one for me growing up. Um, and then Dumbo was the, the other one. Uh, the, the thing about my mother and I is we are so alike and we both have hot tempers, you know, and so we fight all the time. But in I got my, um, my drawing love from my mother, but I also got my movie love from my mom. And in Korea, my mom, her father was the electrician of this small town and would help with the movie theaters that in that village. And my mom would go see the movies all the time, all the time. And so much so that she would draw the posters, like she would draw all the actors and everything. She would tell us this later. And uh, um, when we were growing up, you know, we'd go to the bank, she'd drop the money off. And if there was any money left, she would take my brother and I to the movies. And uh, um, she would take us to see animated movies all the time. And uh, there, you know, and those had a, a huge impact on me. The fact that my mom, most of the time we'd watch American movies and she wouldn't understand any of it. And I don't know how much you guys did this with your parents, but there was always like, oh, you know, like she loves this guy. And I'm like, oh, you know, and you'd explain all the English. But with the animated movies, there was no explanation had to be done. It was told so visually, visually told so well that uh, she understood that. And I remember those times when my mom would be emotionally affected by something. Um, and uh, um, Dumbo was one of them. I remember her very emotional at this. We saw it at a public library somewhere in New York. So it was this shitty yeah. screen and uh, uh, the, this baby mind sequence in Dumbo where like the mom is locked up and caged away and she's reaching out for, you know, this baby elephant. And I remember my mom totally emotional over this and like, oh my gosh, you know, what is it about this? Um, at that time as a kid, I wasn't like, what is it about this? I'm just looking back on it thinking that, but I definitely remember marking how emotional she was over it. And uh, that I, I share a love in that way because of that, of how universal that stuff is. And so, yeah, I was just watching a lot of cartoons. So between Voltron and Dumbo and everything in the middle, like that was the life. You would go into the back of the store, you do your homework and uh, they work till 11 at night. So, you know, the rules were much looser for us. And so we'd watch TV and then, you know, we'd turn it off a half hour before the store would be done. Cause we knew that dad would come in and check the heat of the television to be like, did you guys watch it? <laughs> and you know, we had timed it right like a half hour. It will cool it down enough. And, uh, but it was a lot of cartoons for sure. So you must have continued your art through high school because you ended up at Cal Arts. How did your parents reconcile sending you to art school? Like I was saying with my father that he kind of st stayed ambivalent about it for a while. My mother continued to be against it through high school, that it wasn't going to be the future. And also that she didn't want me to leave New York. That was the other thing. But my father met someone at the art supply shop and my father found out that this guy worked on an animated show in Manhattan somewhere called The Real Ghostbusters. It was like this 80s, 90s TV show. And my father said, oh, you work animation? And the guy's like, yeah. And, uh, and my father just pelted him with like salary questions. Like, how much do you make? Like all this. And uh, um, <laughs> honestly, like, 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 a, like a switch went on, my father said, oh, it's a living. Uh, he, and he, he turned, he said, okay, you know, like, what is the art school that you want to go to? And uh, I was like, I want to go to California to this Disney school. And they're like, what do you need to do for it? And I said, I need to get a portfolio. I need this kind of stuff. And they goes, and this was like in the ninth grade. And I remember him going like, what, what, what do you need to do? And I said, I, I need to learn how to draw people. And this, the, 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 the portfolio I had read from this, our guidance counselor, they, they required like animal sketches and quick sketches and all this stuff. And I showed my father that what the guidance counselor had given me at ninth grade. And uh, he was just like looking at this. And, you know, I, I had applied to art school at night in Manhattan. I went to School of Visual Arts for three to four years during high school, uh, all with the blessing of my dad to build up this portfolio. That's, he was supportive. I remember it's so clearly, you know, like when I had to take photos of the artwork that, you know, I had mm -hmm. done for the portfolio and my father was getting into it. And I was just like, oh man, dad, this is amazing just to see him go from like, you know, you have no future in this, you know, listen to your mother to, 
let, you're taking the photo wrong. You've got to get the light on the drawing. And uh, on, uh, you know, I went to art school and I went through a similar process. Yeah. Um, so I have some questions. I went to uh, weekend um, classes at um, School of Visual Arts as well. Really? Um, mm -hmm. Where, when, when did you do that? Oh, I'm older than you. So I probably did that um, 87, 88 uh, is when I oh, graduated from high school. Yes, wow. yes. I think it's so interesting that your dad was so practical. You know, he'd gone through so many different businesses that he tried out. He really just had a, a practical take on, I want you to be able to support yourself. I want this to be a job. He didn't understand it. And once he found somebody who, who did, you know, have the answers. And um, now I understand, I mean, can you imagine, I've walked into places where um, an Asian man with a uh, father could be asking me, how much do you make? How much do you get paid? And it, it's so intrusive <laughs> that I would, I would be like, wait a minute, you know, are you judging me? You know, but now it, it's like, no, he's actually trying to justify how to, you know, look at his, uh, his son's life and what mm -hmm. could be in store for him. It's so interesting, you know? Yeah. It is very that practical. it changed, yeah. That. But but your mom, she took more convincing, clearly. Yes, and uh, um, I don't know if it was about the art at some point. I, I think it was just about leaving. You know, I think that was it. Uh, you know, like, you know, I love my mother so much, and we used to fight so much, and now we don't have at all anymore. We've come to such, we've gotten so much closer. Um, um, and not that we weren't close. My mother always believed that, like, you know, fighting keeps you close, and so that was kind of her mantra. Mm -hmm. And uh, but. Again, just understanding the psychology of my mother and like how hard she fought for, you know, for my brother and I not to leave, you know, uh, took a long time for us to understand. And, uh, um, you know, the, one of our dark stories about my mother that, you know, you know, is just so powerful was that during the Korean War, this relationship that she had with her with her mother and like the no art world and, you know, like. At that time, you know, everyone was leaving the, the 30th parallel right there. Everyone was going south. And my grandmother and my grandfather split the family up. The grandfather had a truck and took, I think, three of the daughters. And then my grandmother took my mom and uh, my uncle uh, when my uh, mom was five years old on a bike. And uh, they went down these lines. I remember my mom telling me the story, slicing apples, old school Korean, like slicing apples and like telling the story. And uh, she said that a plane came and was like shooting the line and my grandmother had ducked and dropped the bike and, you know, my mom and my uncle fell out of this bike. But then I think the way she tells it is that the plane or something else was coming to shoot again or something was shooting again. And my mom, I mean, my grandmother had just picked up the son, leaving my mom there to, oh. who got shot by a plane or something. And I remember my mom like pulling up her skirt to show us this scar in her <gasps> thigh, this like oh hot, my God. this hot dog shaped mm -hmm. scar. And, uh, mm. you know, and so in high school, when like I would be fighting my mom about like wanting to leave or whatever it was, you know, she would just be like, you, you, you can't scar. go. And uh, no, she wouldn't show it. I, I'm just so <laughs> dense. I didn't make the connection. And I remember my brother, who's two years younger than me, like, I think, I think we were sitting at the airport or something and I was going to go. And she's, you know, my brother's like, you know why she's so crazy about it. Why? I'm like, no, I don't understand her. I don't get it. And uh, um, he was just like, it's because of her mom and, and, you know, what had happened. And then I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, that's right. So you leave the family in New York to go to school in California. Um, so much of your life seems to have started to come together at CalArts. Um, did you feel like you'd found your people once you got there? Yeah, I, I definitely felt that for sure. The, You know, New York was pretty racist. I remember that. And uh, you were so defined by the color of your skin. But then getting out there, you were defined by your sort of nerdiness for this really small niche thing of commercialized animation. I can't even at that time even call it art, really. But, you know, um, um, finding other people that were really passionate about trying to fake life, you know, and try to create this illusion uh, was fascinating. And th that they had all had similar kind of like, no one else knew about it. You had to find it. And there's like this weird, like, you know, you had to find all the information yourself. There's no schools for it at the time. You had, there was every kid, every kid that you met was like, yeah, I had, I found this one book in the library. I'm like, oh my God, I found that same book. And like, it was mm -hmm. this, this connection for sure. I loved it. I, I miss it. 
I can't tell you the, I don't know about you, Juliana, and the art schools that you're going to, if you have that like love of, of that time, but uh, um, uh, I still look back at that, even though it was difficult, s super fondly. Not only did you meet people that you connected to on a work level, but you also ended up meeting your wife there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I had never met anyone as funny as her before and who was such a great artist. And, uh, you know, uh, she could do a drawing that could really crack me up. And, uh, um, yeah, and uh, I knew, you know, that this relationship at that time, like, I don't know how this is going to work. You know, like my grandmother's dying words were, you know, literally like, and then she, she like passed away. And, uh, you know, and uh, my mom was very similar, you know, like they, they weren't like hard on it, but they were, that was what, what it was going to be. I was going to marry a Korean woman. And uh, um, that's, that was the, you know, probably someone from my church, but I met someone that didn't fit that bill. And, uh, you know, I dated her for a while and uh, all the whole time, just like, you know, have you talked to your parents about us? Like, no, I have not. You know, I have, I have lied about you, honestly. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I sent my brother on like these recon missions to ask my parents because he stayed in to, to help my father when I was in California with the shop and like, you know, ask mom, like, what if I, you know, if I married someone Chinese or Japanese and like he, you know, like she would go, he would go ask these hypotheticals to my mom and my mom would blow up and like, what are you talking about on this? Uh, you know, like, and, uh, and uh, um, so I'd be like, boy, this is a big hole. I don't know how I'll ever talk about this with my, my mom and my father. And, and, but I did, but I just, I just remember that time of like, oh yeah, art school and then coming out of art school and being in this relationship and feeling very guilty about it and uh, not knowing what to do about it. Oh, did your brother end up marrying a Korean woman? Yeah, he went to Korea and met this amazing woman, Heather, and uh, um, they fell in love and uh, she came out here and uh, she's this insane pianist and uh, um, they've got mm. two kids and they're living in our, in our parents' house in uh Oh, that she that's a dream. The the, the daughter in law who's a pianist from Korea. <laughs> no, she is a dream. She's amazing. Like, you know, you know, they take she takes care of my brother and her take care of my mom now and uh, you know, they've taken care of my dad when he was around and uh you know, that was the thing when I when I when I married my wife Anna, who's white and from Santa Barbara, California. That was my mom's thing, like when we were talking like about the prospect of this wedding, like, I can't talk to her. I remember her telling me this, like, there's no, I don't, I, like, how are you, gonna, you're going to miss Korean food, Peter, you know, you can't just eat hamburgers your whole life. And I'm like, oh, when I get more Korean food, I'll make it or I'll go someplace. And, uh, you know, and uh, um, um, she, my mom was just like, you're going to miss it. Your brother is doing a great job fulfilling the good Korean son role on his end. Yeah, Juliana, Catherine, I just have to tell you, I, he's my best friend. I have so much love for for him, like you guys have no idea, like the, the his spirituality, his you know his human hum, hum, humanity in him, and his his uh, um, soul is uh, he's an amazing amazing person. Uh, yeah, he 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 has so much of the burden of these traditions. He gladly took. I, I love him a great deal, and and when, when you talk about that, that's like yeah, that he did every turn. Like I rebelled so hard. I fought my parents mm -hmm. so hard in high school for, you know, what those responsibilities were. And uh, I don't know if I ran away and I just assimilated and just got out of, I don't know what all that psychologically was, but my brother um, um, took it all. And uh, uh, it's, he's amazing. Well, now that you're a parent, do you think you understand your parents a, a little better? Yes, I, I feel like I've understand, I've, you know, understood their sacrifices a lot more than I ever have mm -hmm. before. You know, when my dad died, you know, it really put into perspective of like what the eldest son even means now, you know, and uh, my father's work ethic was, his phrase was always work hard, play hard. That was his thing. And uh, um, it, it was beaten to my brother and I for sure. And uh, um, now as an adult and raising kids, when I feel the instinct to go into that groove in the record to just be like, got to work hard. You know, Vivian, Sam, you just have to work hard, work hard, work hard, you know, and uh, do I understand my parents better for that? Yeah, I do. But at the same time, you know, trying to understand the nuances of what that was is, is always, I don't know, I didn't speak Korean well enough to understand the nuance from my parents when they told me this stuff. It was so blunt and so practical. Mm -hmm. and I always took it at mm -hmm. its face value. And then now that I'm 
kind of regurgitating it to my kids, I can see how blunt it was at that time. And then, and then in trying to understand it, trying to dig into the nuances of it with my kids so that they can understand some of that in a deeper way. You know, uh, I lost him, you guys. I lost him. I, I miss him so much. I, I don't know if your parents are around, but uh, uh, it, it, it was devastating just because I, I had put my father on a pedestal. I didn't realize I had until I lost him. We, we, my brother and I only talk about the hard work. We don't talk about all the fun uh -huh. stuff that he did. I don't know how much uh -huh. you, you know, like, I don't know, the classic stuff about like, you know, when, uh, how hard it is to say I love you to your parents. You know, we uh -huh. all those cliches about like, certain Korean parents or relationships and like how stoic they can be became undone the older my father became like yeah he was very stoic but then you know when he was nearing retiring he would he started saying I love you and then he started getting more goofy and more silly and more loving when we had grandkids and so when he had grandkids mm -hmm. and so like this other side started to appear and then he was taken away you know and so that there was that that guy that had come out uh, he was there when we were kids. We just, yeah. we just don't remember it. It makes me wonder about um, the Good Dinosaur, which Juliana and I both adored, and the father figure in that film, who's really just a paragon of kind of wisdom and love, and so patient. Did you think of your father as you were creating that character? Yeah, I, I would say you know that film is a really um, um, it had this kind of like history to it where. Um, the original director that I was working with had been taken off and then I was kind of thrown into the hot seat. They had asked me to, to kind of take over. And so the original version of that story was my good friend of mine, um, Bob Peterson, who had come up with a story who, about his father and his relationship in, 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 in Ohio. And he grew up around the Amish. And so there was like, it had, that was the original story of, of it. The, the father was very stoic in that, in that, in that version of the story. And so there was a little, a lot of, the, the dad that is in the movie now comes from that seed, from my friend's original concept. The idea of this farm, these farmers and this, the harsh work life, definitely, you know, like I was, I remember talking to the team about like, you know, these kind of stoic families that like, you know, immigrant parents are and uh, grow up. But like, I can't say that it's huge. The next project I'm working on definitely has a lot more of uh, my dad, not only, you know, because of what, you know, is going on, you just can't help it. But I say survival because that's what that time was at that time, you know, because like the film had not a lot of time left and uh, we were just racing to to make something as truthful as possible with a little amount of time. And uh, this idea of being thrown into the wilderness, this idea of not having sea legs and not knowing how to, you know, survive with the job just became a part of the movie, you know, and uh, so there was that parallel to it for sure. Um, um, but yeah, I don't know if I could say that it's like a lot of my father in there. But yeah, is this getting too dark, Juliana, Catherine? I, I, no, I'm thinking no, about no, my no. dad and it's all like, no, no, no. I feel like I'm no. depressing you guys and I'm like. We appreciate that you're willing to open up, be personal and share your stories. The light and funny is great, but the darker and honest stories are so important for people to hear. And I'm sure that many can identify with it too. Right on, right on. Yeah, well, you, guys, you guys want something lighter? I feel like... Well, okay, well, we do want to ask about... We do have a few questions. When we first learned about you and we learned that you were the physical model for Russell in Up, I mean, that's pretty cool. Will you tell us a little bit about the, how that came about? And what was that like? Developing anything at, 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 at Pixar specifically, like you come up with ideas and then you'll always toss ideas. You never know if anything is going to be real or not until the very end. Like there's just no way. One, as we were coming up with this stuff, when you're working there, a lot of the artists will caricature each other just to spend the time. So like, I'm looking at both of you right now and I'm imagining how I would draw you guys. And like, it's just what people at Pixar do in the art department. And so a friend of mine drew me as a thumb with a hat, like this, just this, this thumb, this fat chubby thumb with a hat. And they were joking about like, oh my God, like what if this was, you know, the design, just this like kind of weird egg. And uh, that started making people laugh and that started forming a character that they started developing. And uh, um, I would just board stuff, helping the project with this old man and this this Asian character. And there were, there were the questions about like, you know, 
you know, like accents and stuff. And I'm like, I'm Korean American. I, you know, like, I don't know what accents I have. Do you need to have this accent? Like, you know, like, you know, and, uh, you know, when it came to casting, you know, like I did all the scratch voice for it and, uh, um, uh, where it would just be like trying to get into a high pitched voice and, you know, like, Hey, Mr. Fredrickson. And that was the game of like at Pixar, like you would just do scratch performances just to get the reels up and going. So you do drawings, then you would just bring your friends in and just record voices knowing that it would be all temp. They, you know, they, they found a real kid that was amazing. And, uh, that's, then that character was kind of off and going from that point on and, uh, became its own thing. But, uh, it was a mix of a lot of, a lot of elements, but, uh, I'm super, I was super proud that there's, there was an Asian character in an animated film, uh -huh. you know, like, and uh, that there was this Asian kid in this movie that felt not stereotypical, you know, that, uh -huh. you know, that was, uh, yeah, super proud of, of, of what they had done, you know. And will you tell us a little bit about doing all this voice work? I guess it's not so unusual for Pixar animators to do some voice work, but you seem to be doing it pretty consistently. Like, is this something that as a kid you like to mimic people? Like, did you do any acting as a kid or anything like that? No acting. My The only thing my brother and I ever did that might have been connected to this was we would just record ourselves. I don't know if you guys had those old school recorders and you would, we would just do like TV shows for ourselves. That was it. I didn't do any acting. Um, um, but I was around theater a lot. I, I I played in the in the the band for you know for plays and uh, but I didn't do any acting. Nor did I ever think that I would at Pixar. It would just be about like when you're in the story department there, you are drawing the images of the story, but you'd be pitching them, and that's sort of the game. So you would be like, all right, so Mr. Ferguson, he's all grumpy and he walks through the house, and then Russell comes in, and he's like, hey, Mr. Ferguson. So you'd be pitching these stories, trying to do these like bullcrappy voices. The first thing that I had done was for Brad Bird on in The Incredibles. He was just like, hey, you're from New York and you, you can you sound like a mugger? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know, Brad, if I can, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and he just like come in and then there was this mugger character that I that I had done first and then he just kept it in there. And uh, again, I, I had no idea that it was going to be anything, but it was all because of Brad just pulling uh, some of us in there just to do that. And uh, um and then for Ratatouille, it was the same director. And uh, I was doing the scratch voice at that time for another chubby character who ate garbage. And the, the joke was always like, you're chubby and you eat garbage. Why don't you play this character? And so it was these kind of like gifts that these the, the directors would give. Uh, again, I I don't consider myself an actor in that way. And, and uh, um, but, I, but I love having fun uh, with, 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 with friends. Could you talk about co-directing the English language version of Ponyo? Studio Ghibli is so magical and Catherine and I are so charmed by all of their movies. Can you tell us what that experience was like? I got asked to do this, I think because I had helped out with Russell and Up, helping direct kids and then uh, through Good Dino helping with uh, uh, with kid performances. And uh, um, uh, I don't know if that was before or after, you know, I don't even remember anymore. Wow. The, the producers were Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall and John Lasseter. And uh, they, a lot of the um, previous Miyazaki movies had gone through this connection with Lasseter because, you know, John was really good friends with Hayao Miyazaki. And uh, um, this was one of the latest ones that had gone through. And so the, uh, I had come to help with those kids. And I am, like you guys, totally a huge nerd over Miyazaki's films and all of that Takahara and that Studio Ghibli and all the films that they have made there. They're just seminal. Getting to um, work with them and their team was, you know, just the highlight of my life for sure. But the process of it was pretty difficult, not having done ADR like that before. The two performers that they had found were not actors. So it was a lot of like trust games to try to get them to emote and get vulnerable for the, the screen. And it took a little while, but uh, uh, that process of doing that was a great learning experience and translating something from Japanese to English. The writer, Melissa Matheson, who was part of the translator, had wrote, written E.T. And, and these big movies and trying to understand what Miyazaki was doing and translating that and trying to fit that into these already pre-animated mouths were um, with these two kids was amazing work. You know, that was really, really wild. And, uh, you know, got to see, you know, Miyazaki's process a little bit, meeting him and then hanging with him at a studio. 
uh, in Japan it was just awesome. Like, uh, um, and to this day, like, I don't know, I may have some stress dreams over it just because it was, was a lot of pressure. <laughs> you know? Pixar is such a great animation studio. Their stories are so well written and heartfelt. Um, increasingly, they have showcased more diverse characters. The stories are set in different cultures and they tackle subjects like climate change and advocate for strong female characters. I wonder if there are any stories or topics that you're personally interested in exploring more. And now that you have your own kids, what kind of stories would you like to make for your own children? Yeah, I think because I'm in an interracial relationship and trying to understand what like culture is to an identity has been a big theme that uh, you know I, I, I keep thinking about with their upbringing and trying to have them understand the ingredients of who they are and is it just cultural and uh, that's huge for me you know um, having films talk about race in these ways. Uh, without it being messagey or anything is something that I'm I'm always been interested in, but again I don't even want to say it in that way. I just feel like, you know, it's part of my life was so defined by it, but now it's not. And uh, it, I mean, it still is. I just mean wanting to make sure that, you know, my kids have a way of talking about it that is clear for them. You know, and uh, it's not that no one's looking to like manipulate or try to find these things. It, Honestly, these story sessions become like therapy sessions where everyone's just talking uh -huh. about pieces of their lives that they're dealing with or, you know, like, you know, uh, and then those start to turn into these characters. But they never are like, let's talk about, you know, you know, emotions in this way. It was just like, yeah. you know, it just it just in, in the thoughtful process of making these stories, does it come about and become a part of it. And uh, I, I think that would be the end of that place if they started doing it the other way, where it's like, yeah. we've got to make a message movie. And now, You're right, because as parents, we're always looking for an opportunity to bring up sensitive topics for discussion. And watching a movie about race or relationships or protecting the environment together with your kids is a great way for parents to start uh, that discussion and ask, Hey, what'd you think of that? Yeah, absolutely. And trying to connect at that level too. I believe everyone has a permanent age. This is a weird thing to say, but like, I'm sure you guys all have friends that are like, oh, that, that person was born 80 years old, just wise beyond their years. And then like, and then that, that adult is always 12 years old. Like, and so there's always like a, I call it a permanent age to them. And uh, uh, there is at Pixar to me, a lot of youthful personalities that can see the world with those naive eyes sometimes. There is that collaboration with people that that bring these points of views to a film that allow these different access points to a film, you know what I mean? And uh, I think that's a big part of uh, the ingredients to uh, some of these movies that really these Pixar films that really can connect to a wide audience without it being pandery or Bull crappy, you know. Thank you to Peter Son for being our guest on K Pod, a production of KoreanAmericanStory.org. You can follow us on Instagram at KoreanAmericanStory, where we'll be posting some great photos from the episode, including one of Peter's dad in front of their grocery store in the Bronx. And you can find Peter on Instagram at PeteSon18. Our audio engineer is AJ Valente. Our executive producer is HJ Lee. You can follow me at Catherine Hong 100 and you can follow Juliana at Juliana underscore Son. Take care. <laughs>